We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football. Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s. Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday Sports. Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories. And Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com slash sportshistorybooks. Pick up your copy today! Soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io. In this episode of the Football History Rewind, part number 48, we discuss the rules revisions of 1921 regarding punting, holding, fair catches, and more, and their impact on today's game, as well as many more legendary stories, all coming up in just a moment. This is the Pigskin Daily History Dispatch, a podcast that covers the anniversaries of American football events throughout history on a day-to-day basis. Your host, Darren Hayes, is podcasting from America's North Shore to bring you the memories of the gridiron one day at a time. So as we come out of the tunnel of the Sports History Network, let's take the field and go no huddle through the portal of positive gridiron history with pigskindispatch.com. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Hello, my football friends. This is Darren Hayes of pigskindispatch.com. Welcome once again to the Pigpen, your portal to positive football history. And we are in Football History Rewind, part number 48. We have covered a lot of ground here in football history as we're going through it year by year. And uh, 1921 was a big year. We had six national champions, and uh, we've talked about four of them so far. Uh, next episode, uh, episode 49, part 49 of the series, we're going to be talking about the final two, uh, the Cal Golden Bears and the Lafayette Leopards. So stay tuned for that in a couple days. But today, in, uh, we're going to talk about the rest of the rules revisions. And there were some kind of more important ones uh, regarding punting and holding and fair catch that really affected the game of today. Now, the type of football that took place over 85 to 100 years ago is very interesting uh, for the person of this era to look back upon and to just see how far the game has come since the 1920s. Now, then again, there are some items uh, perused in 1921, uh, Spalding's official football guide that are worded almost to the letter with the corresponding rules in the 21st century. And the football rules definitely fit the old adage, the more things change, the more they stay the same. The last segment of the series gave a very interesting perspective to the rule of 1921 as sketches of legal and illegal plays from the Spalding's Guide were posted with the permission of the NCAA as discussed in Spalding. And this edition of uh, the, the Football History Rewind will continue the discussion and present even more of the over 100-year-old hand sketches to the reader. Now, first of all, we have a fair catch uh, sketch that figures number 9 and 10. And these can be seen on pigskindispatch.com uh, under this uh, Football History Rewind part number 48. And the, these are the do's and the don'ts of a fair catch signal. Uh, it's the, one of those rules and signals that has survived the test of time. And the 1921 version of the fair catch signal has the key elements of prior to an attempted catch, quote, unquote, and then, quote, the hand clearly above the player's head, unquote, just as figure number nine shows. The corresponding uh, NFHS rules 2-9-3 reads very similar to its ancient predecessor in the NCAA rulebook. Now it says, quote, a valid fair catch signal is extending and the lateral waving of one arm at full length above the head by any member of the receiving team, end quote. Sounds very similar to that 1921 rule. Uh, The similarities of the rules are many, although in modern times, the arm must be waved. It simply had to be raised uh, back in 1921. Figure number 10 shows an example of an invalid signal in 1921. And the same signal, if used today, would also be considered invalid. It sort of has the the figure standing there and uh, he's almost doing a a hello, uh, you know, elbow bent severely, hand up in the air, not above his head, not even with his head. 
illegal, invalid fair catch signal. I'm sorry, illegal fair catch signal, not an invalid one, illegal fair catch signal. Uh, just like it is in today's game, uh, that would be it should draw a penalty flag because it's not a valid signal. Now, the subject of tripping came up in the figure number 11 shown on pigskindispatch.com in the article of history, Football History Rewind, part number 48, uh, is right from the 1921 guide uh, from Spalding. It demonstrates what is considered a trip in that day. And according to the 1921 rules, it was illegal for an opponent to obstruct a player with his leg, hand, or arm below his knee. A trip back then basically is still the same as today in the National Football Federation rules and the NCAA rules, uh, which say, quote, tripping is the use of a lower leg or foot to obstruct an opponent who is not the runner below the knee, end quote. Almost identical. The rule really hasn't changed the high school level from what it was 100-some years ago in the college level. Uh, the, the newer version also calls it the use of hand below the knee to obstruct an opponent without the ball is a trip since it's reclassified this illegal act as a hold. Uh, it may even be an illegal block below the waist. So a couple other variations there to might make the penalty even more severe, change the whole category uh, altogether. So it might not be a trip. As a side note in figure number 11, it's interesting to see the description that says, quote, the player wearing the sweater, end quote, in reference to pointing out that particular player in the sketch. Of course, uh, our players today do not wear the sweaters. We call them the jerseys or the uniform jersey. So, but they did wear sweaters back then for that extra padding that they provided. Uh, figure number 12 from 1921, the legal block. Well, or was it a legal block? The next illustrated example from this antiquity is an interesting one indeed when compared to the modern rules of the game. Figure number 12 clearly shows and states that the offensive player is initiating contact on the opponent's thigh. By today's standards, this is mainly an illegal starting point for the block, except in certain cases. Now, the National Football of High School, National Federation of High School Sports, uh, NFHS version of free blocking zone, allows players who are clearly on their team's line at the snap and within the defined boundaries of the free blocking zone, which is basically a six yard by eight yard box centered around the ball, may block below the waist on an opponent who is also clearly in the boundaries of the free blocking zone at the snap on the initial charge after the snap. The other is the instance of, there are a few instances where a player A can initiate contact below an opponent's waist, such as the thigh. This is the subject of holding. The final illustration on the, uh, segment number 14, figure 14, describes an example of illegal use of hand and arm by a player in 1921. This middle player depicted in the sketch is grasping the jersey, or the sweater back then, of an opponent in an effort to obstruct him from getting to the runner. According to the enforcement of that era, this action would penalize the offending team 15 yards for the illegal holding action. A hold by today's standards in high school, college, and pro is a le slightly lesser penalty of 10 yards, uh, but in 1921, it would be illegal nonetheless, just five yards difference in the penalty enforcement. It's evident that all of the illustrations presented in this segment and in the one prior, that the basics of the football rules were in place, you know, 10 decades ago, a century ago, the strategies, equipment, and overall appearance of the game may have changed over time, but the basic fundamentals of legality have remained fairly constant for these hundred or so years since 1921. So very interesting indeed. Take a look at the figures over on pigskindispatch.com and uh, you know, you'll find it very interesting too. Uh, the players, of course, are dressed more like uh, somebody going out for a Sunday walk in the, the fall, uh, but they are football players there with the gear at the time. So hope you enjoyed this little bit of history. We'll cover more every day, just like we do. Uh, two days from now, we're going to cover that last of the 1921 season, those two co-champions, the final two co-champions of 21 like with Cal and Lafayette. So till then, have a great football day. And till tomorrow, have a great gridiron day. Peeking up at the clock, the time's running down. We're going to go into victory formation, take a knee, and let this baby run out. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you back tomorrow for the next podcast. 
we invite you to check out our website, pigskindispatch.com, not only to see the daily football history, but to experience positive football with our many articles on the good people of the game, as well as our own football comic strip, Cleet Marks Comics. Pigskindispatch.com is also on social media outlets, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and don't forget the Pigskin Dispatch YouTube channel to get all of your positive football news and history. Special thanks to the talents of Mike and Gene Monroe, as well as Jason Neff for letting us use their music during our podcast. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. It was just another ordinary day in the offices of the Pittsburgh Guardian newspaper circa 1924. But for Marla Delft, assistant editor, everything was about to change. For she was about to discover the awesome attractiveness of Row 1 brand retro sports paraphernalia items, thanks to Orville Mulligan, sports writer. And there it is. Wow, Orville, that's really the bee's knees. Isn't it just? A poster-sized replica of the actual 1909 World Series program cover. I can see that. But where did you get it? And where'd you get it framed? I ordered it from the Row 1 website, where over 6,000 items of sports memorabilia from the 1880s to the 1990s are available for reproduction in multiple sizes and in several different materials, with over a dozen styles of frame to choose from for prints like this. Well, I'm sure Mr. Delft would love to put up more of these in the office. But I'm equally as sure they're beyond this newspaper's budget. (laughs) Not at all, my dear Marla. See for yourself. Go to sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one. Sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one. Oh my, these are good prices. Oh, and look at this stuff. Oklahoma, Nebraska football. College basketball art. Michael Jordan items. And so it was that Marla Delft discovered the spondiferous magic of row one sports memorabilia arts and prints. You can, too, by visiting sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one. That's R-O-W number one today for access to the full row one catalog of gallery prints and gifts like t-shirts, long sleeve shirts, telephone cases, coffee mugs, blankets, pillows, towels, and even shower curtains. Act A for a 15% discount off all prints with coupon code SHN15 and 20% off all other items with coupon code SHN20 at checkout. And keep your dial locked to the Sports History Network for the exciting chronicles of the 1920 sports world in Orville Mulligan, sports writer, coming soon. Oh,